Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Pujo. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we'll talk to Carl Crader, co-founder of Great Plus. Great Plus is a project from Consensus that is seeking to reinvent the nature of how energy transactions happen on our grids today. Carl, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. So before we begin, tell us about your background and how you came to be involved in the blockchain space. Uh, so I got involved in uh, Bitcoin, just kind of buying you know, as a speculator back in about 2012 uh, time frame. Um, it was also uh, the time frame that I was in uh, grad school uh, doing my uh, PhD on advanced battery materials, energy storage. And um, I actually met Alex Miller uh, during uh, my PhD. He was one of my classmates. He was working on a, uh, a degree in computational physics. And he ended up graduating with a master's degree and went to work for Consensus uh, eventually. And he started working on some of their energy projects, uh, one of which was networking together a swarm of smart batteries and having those batteries have what we call an autonomous agent, which would essentially buy and arbitrage energy uh, with each other over time. And in that project, he needed some battery expertise. So he uh, called me up and I did some consulting for them as kind of a subject matter expert uh, on that project. And then eventually uh, started working full time for Consensus um, in uh, May of this year. So your LinkedIn profile says you were like director of energy for Consensus. Uh, what did you do as director of energy? So um, basically, Consensus has a, a couple of different uh, business areas. Uh, one of which is what we call enterprise consulting. So it's basically doing uh, project development with uh, energy companies that are looking at. Uh, using blockchain uh, in some way and having consensus kind of be the technical arm for doing a proof of concept um, with an implementation of, of blockchain. Uh, so there were, were a couple uh, projects, right? Like the one with the smart batteries. Uh, there were also some sort of inbound interests, but most of the time that I've been at consensus, I've really been focused on uh, Grid Plus uh, as a project. So uh, what is Grid Plus? as an overview. Yeah, so Grid Plus is going to hopefully be the world's first blockchain-based electrical utility. And what that means is that our customers will be able to buy, sell, and settle their energy in real time using uh, the blockchain. So in an application like that, so when I imagine myself uh, like buying electricity, um, it's generally I have a contract with a company and I pay like a like a flat charge. Uh, so number of units consumed multiplied by a standard rate per per unit. Electricity comes, the meter records, and then I pay the particular unit. Uh, what does blockchain technology have to do here? Like, why is blockchain at all suited to this kind of transaction? Well, so there's a couple sort of factors that are uh, coming together that is making uh, blockchain very interesting uh, for the electricity markets. The, the first of which is just the sort of intrinsic nature of, of the markets themselves. And electricity markets are interesting because they're a commodities market. But unlike any other commodities market, which is typically uh, contracts that are signed and then settled on a cash basis, so they're, they're typically what we would call uh, a futures contract, in the electricity markets, most of the contracts are what we call forwards contracts because unlike futures contracts, which are settled in cash, forwards contracts are actually settled in the delivery of electricity. Uh, that's also coupled with the fact that uh, if you look at the electrical grid, there's not really a lot of energy storage on the grid. So uh, production and consumption essentially happens in real time. 
and these two things always have to be balanced with each other. So you have this, this forwards commodities market where the product is being created and destroyed kind of instantaneously. So if we have a financial system that requires us to settle not instantaneously, we need to have a process of collateralization and segmentation in the markets to essentially mitigate counterparty risk. And that's kind of how the markets are currently set up. So when people talk about uh, this idea of a utility that they're paying a flat rate, the utility is actually buying this energy out of a wholesale market if we're talking about a deregulated market. They're then marking that up, paying a distribution charge, and then selling that energy at a flat rate to the customer. The whole purpose of that intermediate that, that intermediary, in this case the utility, is to essentially uh, collateralize the risk of their customers of payment, uh, such that the other wholesale market participants don't have counterparty risk. But if you take a world where the customers themselves can settle for their electricity consumption in real time, you can start to uh, reduce the need for that collateralization by the intermediary. And in the far off future, you could actually think about a system where customers would be directly interacting with the wholesale markets. So I, th I think a lot of people sort of take for granted the fact that they have electricity just flowing <laughs> into their into their homes and you know powering their lights and, and stoves and you know um, computers and all these devices that we use. Um, and I think for a lot of people that don't don't really fully comprehend so the the journey of an electron uh, that's being produced, say in a nuclear power plant or um, in a coal fire power plant or by some re renewable energy source. And that the journey of that electron to to your house and like into your smartphone charging, um, can, can you walk us through that? Like, so, say for instance, in, in a, you mentioned Texas, uh, in a deregulated market like Texas, uh, who are the different stakeholders or, or like the different uh, pr players in this energy supply chain? Right. Right. So the the players in the energy supply chain can be segmented really into four categories. So the first one being generators, which are sort of these nuclear power plants, these large coal power plants. You can also think about utility scale, say wind or solar production, um, and those are your your generators. So they're they're classified as people that are generating more than a megawatt uh, of of power. Uh, that energy is created by the generators and then is transmitted down the transmission infrastructure and the transmission are the, uh, is basically the movement of electricity over these high voltage uh, power lines. And then that gets to what we call a distribution network, which is a lower voltage, shorter distance network that you would kind of think about like within a city. And, uh, and then that goes to the consumer. And in the middle of all this, you have uh, what we'd call a retailer. Most people would refer to them as their utility and the utility is actually just this financial um, uh, intermediary that buys the energy out of these wholesale markets uh, that the generators are selling into, then repackages and sells that energy to the customer, and then pays a fee to the transmission and distribution network uh, for, for moving the electricity. Okay. So, I mean, you could kind of um, compare this to you know, some sort of a logistics supply chain for, you know, like any kind of consumer product. You have like someone producing the product and then you have logistical, um, you know, distribution. And then you have retailers at the end who buy that product. Um, that product, they have to pay for transit of that product, right? For basically the, the, the shipment. And then they sell it to consumers. Um, in this case, we have the generators. We have different levels of distribution. So we have the high capacity lines, high voltage lines, and then the lower voltage lines sort of in urban areas or in cities. And then the retailers who buy that energy uh, wholesale and, and then sell it to consumers and mark up uh, and try to make a, a profit on, on, on that service of, of selling that energy. And as you say, uh, sort of... Um, uh, collateralize, the, collateralize the risk. Um, and I, I think it's probably important to point out as well that in most places, while generators are typically 
can be private actors, but also public actors. The the distribution network is usually public infrastructure, correct? Yeah. So so in in a deregulated market, uh, there's there's also one other sort of actor in in the in the market that's called the ISO. Um, independent system operator. And so in Texas, there it's, it's ERCOT. And the ISO, or ERCOT, is responsible essentially for the reliability uh, and stability of, of the network holistically. So they're actually the ones that are setting up these wholesale markets. And there's, there's other markets besides just the wholesale markets. There's uh, ancillary services markets, there's demand response markets. Uh, and they basically create these markets and, and set the uh, amount of essentially needed generation at any given point in time or the amount of a needed resource uh, such that the other actors in the market can then respond to help sort of keep the grid in balance on, on this real-time basis. So it's a little bit different than, than most supply chains in that most supply chains don't have this, this sort of instantaneous uh, production consumption dynamic, right? There's, there's some sort of capacitance in the network of supply uh, and, and that's, that's a, a, a dynamic that is, is sort of really important when we look at the electricity markets and, and is one of the reasons that blockchain is particularly well suited uh, to potentially acting as the financial settlement process in that system. Would, would the ISO uh, be responsible for, uh, I'm not sure if I'm translating this right, but what we would call um, energy erasement or um, I'm not sure what, I'm, so basically in the, in, in high peak times, um, they would ask for large energy con, uh, con consumers, say, for instance, in industry, uh, industrials, and, and, and even consumers, you know, to uh, reduce their energy consumption uh, as part of their contract and would, would offer retribution for that? Yes, uh, yes. So, what's the so, term for that in English? Uh, so there's, there's, there's two different ways that they do that. So one is just through this idea of the wholesale market. So sort of the, the, the rate is determined by... Uh, the, the ISO basically sets the amount of energy that's needed to be produced or, uh, at, at any given point in time. And that essentially affects the, the clearing price in the wholesale market. So that's one of these mechanisms that they use. Another mechanism, uh, which I think you're more alluding to, is what we call demand response. And so in demand response, if I'm a commercial entity and, and I have uh, some amount of uh, ability to stop my consumption at any given point in time. Say I have uh, a smelting furnace or I have a refrigerator and I can turn that off for 15 minutes or an hour. Uh, I can basically bid my services into this, uh, um, into this demand response market either independently if I'm large enough or in an aggregated way through what we call a qualified scheduling entity if I'm, if I'm smaller. Uh, but essentially, they'll pay me to turn off at a given point in time to help in this uh, achieving balance for the grid. So, th so there's these mechanisms either through price or through these, these secondary markets that, that reward a consumer or a, 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 at least large commercial and industrial consumers to essentially be somewhat responsive. Now, for customers, customers don't have a really good way of getting paid to be responsive. Uh, and that's just because there hasn't been uh, uh, aggregators that kind of were willing to pass through the price. So if you think about your utility or your retail energy provider, retail elect electricity provider, as they're called in Texas, or REP, they do that. They just don't pay their customers for doing it, right? So they'll they'll sell you, say, a smart thermostat, and they'll turn your electricity off at peak time because they gave you a free smart thermostat, but they won't actually pay you for it. They'll, they'll kind of keep that money uh, and they'll just turn your AC off whenever they feel like it. And of course, this is, this is, a, this is one area I think where uh, blockchains could, you know, in fact, be, uh, be interesting uh, to implement to, 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 to have that, um, that real-time payment uh, and also, also the traceability. So, I, you know, at Stratum, we've looked at this for uh, industrial actors and one of the problems that uh, the ISOs have is um, providing is having having the real time traceability of when 
the consumption was reduced, you know, in in the context of an industrial actor, and so we had been looking at ways in which uh, you could provide that traceability with blockchain networks. Um, one other thing I'd like to touch on, I think, again, people sometimes I think would take for granted is, and I'd like you to to give your thoughts on this is, um, the, this notion of uh, you know you know green energy now, so if, and and how green energy is distributed and sold on on uh, these distribution networks. So with the internet, you know, you can route a packet. So I, I can send a packet from a server and have it arrive at a destination. Um, however, that's not the case for energy. An, an electron on a network, uh, on a distribution network is the same, whether it came from a smelter, whether it came from uh, a you know, nuclear power plant, or whether it came from a solar panel uh, on a, in a solar farm. Now, uh, can you explain... Uh, how then, as a consumer, I'm able to buy, for instance, green energy uh, from like a green energy retailer and benefit from, say, tax credits uh, from the government um, or some other type of subsidy, knowing that we can't really differentiate how how that where that where those electrons go. Yeah. So the the way the um, the green energy system uh, currently works is you have something called a renewable energy credit. So if I have a solar panel on my home, uh, there's an entity in the jurisdiction, uh, it could be the ISO, typically I think it would be the ISO for most jurisdictions, they basically will give you a credit for excess production for that, uh, that asset. So if I produce a kilowatt hour, I put it on the grid, I get a, uh, a, a, a credit for producing a kilowatt hour of, of green solar energy. Um, and then that credit has some value because either individuals or organizations have a preference and or a mandate for using electricity from certain sources. So they'll end up buying the electricity off the grid, which is any old electron. It could come from a coal plant. It could come from a nuclear plant. But in addition to that, they'll buy one of these uh, renewable energy credits. And in doing that, they're essentially subsidizing or rewarding the production of the electricity from a, a, a renewable resource. So that's the mechanism of financial pass-through that exists, even though the electrons don't necessarily flow from you know, the solar panel to the person that's paying for the solar energy. So the, the key idea here is that in this supply chain of like, generators uh, the wholesale market the retailers that are buying from the wholesale market um, and the final consumer is the idea of grid plus that you can basically decentralize the retailer uh, or basically remove that retailing aspect altogether from the supply chain you're 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 trying to minimize the the lack of value add of the retailer i suppose and you're trying to create a system which allows more efficient market dynamics to be reflected. So um, one of the interesting things when you talk about solar, uh, particularly, is the incentive structures that exist, right? So solar is great. We all love solar. But solar creates a problem for the electrical grid. And that problem is that it's what we call an intermittent uh, generator right so we can't control when solar produces it produces when the sun shines it stops producing when a cloud you know comes overhead or, or the sun goes down so we don't have essentially control over our solar production and so what that means is that the other actors in the grid the the base loads the the coal-fired power plants the nuclear power plants the ones that aren't intermittent have to respond to make up for the intermittency of solar. So there's this, this externality of adding solar uh, to the grid. And in low sort of percentages, a couple of percent penetration of solar, that's really not a problem. But as you get to higher and higher percentages, the ability of the other people to respond becomes much more difficult, but also the ability of those people to have uh, operate at a financially sustainable cost point because uh, their production is essentially being uh, 
deprioritized to the green production means that they're going to get lower utilization of their capitalized assets, right? So you have this sort of technical control issue. You also have this this sort of economic issue of of uh, getting ROI on on investment, um, and and so the the incentive structures like are relatively misaligned. So for example, in Austin, if I have a solar panel and I put it up on my home, Austin Energy will actually give me a penny more for my solar production than I pay them to consume electricity. So they're actually rewarding me because I'm putting this green energy out, but they're disincentivizing me uh, to essentially make up or try to put a resource in place that uh, balances out the intermittency of my consumption. And that resource would typically be like a battery. So if I take a solar panel and I pair it with a battery, that battery can essentially levelize my, my production over time so that I'm putting that energy onto the grid when the grid needs it most, and I'm potentially pulling energy out of the grid when there's excess supply and, and lack of demand. So, so solar plus a battery is a sustainable system, but the economics that exist sort of today don't create these mechanisms of sustainability. And we're actually kind of seeing that in a lot of places. So up in Dallas, for example, there's a lot of uh, people that have solar panels that are under net metering. And that's fine, but the, um, the distribution operator has now added just a flat fixed charge of, I think it's $40 a month. Uh, so even if you're essentially producing more than you're consuming in net, they still hit you with this flat rate of, of 40 bucks a month to kind of offset some of these uh, externalities that you're creating on the grid. And, and the fact that you're using the distribution infrastructure, but you're not really paying for it uh, based off how solar places are calculated. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, the, the, the problem is something like this, that, that during the day, there are like hours of peak usage, uh, hours of, of low usage. So like the demand is itself fluctuating. And then solar itself has a, has a fluctuating production characteristic. So some parts of the day, the sun is shining, it will produce a lot. Other parts of the day, it will produce less. So if I have a home, so and I have solar panels on top of my home, the, the problem is that I'm producing an excess of electricity, maybe when there is actually a surplus. So I might be supplying electricity to the grid, but then I might be supplying it in a time of surplus. And uh, at the point where uh, I'm not supplying, maybe that is the time that uh, the grid actually needs production. Yeah, yeah. so, so like at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., you'll see kind of these peaks in demand. And with solar production, you'll see production peak midday and then fall off, you know, outside of these, you know, you know, af it'll ramp up after the morning peak time and fall off before the evening peak time. So it's, it's doing its most production kind of in midday where you're not getting sort of peak demand. And then it goes away when you do have peak demand. And so that's, that's sort of the mismatch. So, so basically like when I'm a, a solar producer, there's this mismatch. And at, even as somebody who's producing more energy than he or she consumes through solar panels, uh, I, I still have to depend on the, on, on basically the grid, like the, the distribution grid and the, and the power producers in order to um, sub furnish me with electricity when I need electricity, but solar is not producing that electricity. So I'm charged for it. Even though I'm producing like, even let's say like I'm using X kilowatt hours of electricity and producing Y and Y is greater than X, I still need to pay a charge because uh, they are giving me the facility of consuming electricity when I need it the most and solar is not producing. Correct, and you're also using the distribution network and you're also consuming electricity when demand is higher and you're producing it when demand is lower. So all of these factors mean that you should still be paying something to somebody. 
even if x is equal to y in your scenario, like you, you still are using more resource than you're essentially uh, producing. So when I couple it with a battery though, uh, I can I can still save more because I can store it my solar production itself in the form of a battery and then use drain from my battery when um, in the evening when no solar is being produced, but I, I myself need a lot of demand. Yeah, so so the battery helps smooth out that production versus to, to better match demand, right? So if if a consumer is exposed to essentially the actual rates, not flat rates, you know, but but the variation in electricity prices over the day, they can then be incentivized to store their production and either use it later or uh, sell it later at a higher price. And so the battery helps balance uh, supply and demand uh, in a more sort of economically efficient way. So it, it appears to me that the, that the key um, sort of hypothesis behind Grid Plus is that today we, we, have a, we have a system in which there's a retailer that gives me a flat rate. I'm not exposed to the actual variation of energy prices during the day. So that's like the, the, the current system. And your hypothesis appears to be that if you move to a system where um, the consumer and consumer is actually exposed to the fluctuation in energy prices during the day, then automatically that consumer will end up putting a solar panel and a battery and participating in this market. And this can sort of lead the switch to um, uh, lead a switch in the market from a current large scale utility to a solar based sort of local energy economy. Yeah, so so it's it's doing a couple things. One, it, I I think that's a pretty good summary, right? And so, um, it's basically putting the financial mechanisms in place and the incentives in place to allow us to incrementally move towards this idea of renewable distributed electricity uh, electrical grids. And, and, and that's kind of like what we see it as. So uh, Grid Plus is trying to bring efficiencies today just through uh, better price points from a retail perspective, but then also sort of create the infrastructure necessary to allow uh, a better sort of economic uh, remuneration of market participants based off the actual sort of uh, resources that they're providing, which if you look at, solar panels and batteries, they're arguably one of the most efficient uh, mechanisms for producing energy. So uh, over time in most markets, you're going to incentivize more and more green energy, and then you're giving a mechanism for consumers to actually uh, get return on investment and monetize those investments over time. So uh, before we get into the specifics of Grid Plus, could you just uh, give us a, you know, few minutes uh, talking about uh, consensus, uh, consensus energy and uh, what kind of projects have been pushed under under this uh, uh, this sort of you know, subgroup within consensus yeah so uh, consensus has been working on uh, energy projects for uh, more than two years uh, the first one was called the Brooklyn microgrid it was a partnership with uh, a company called lo3 and consensus was essentially the technical um, side of, of the project. And what the uh, Brooklyn Microgrid was, it was the first uh, example or proof of concept of doing electricity uh, exchange between uh, consumers, uh, essentially, and their neighbors. So you had uh, this neighborhood in Brooklyn that had solar production, and essentially those people were then directly selling that solar production to people that didn't have solar production. And the mechanism for doing the settlement was was via the blockchain. So it's this kind of idea of doing peer-to-peer -peer, um, electricity sales. Uh, since then, we've done a number of other projects. Another project was something called InnoG. Uh, it was, or sorry, it was called Cotricity, which was a joint project with InnoG. InnoG is uh, one of Germany's largest utilities, uh, formerly RWE. Uh, but what that was was basically uh, a similar sort of variant on uh, the Brooklyn microgrid, but at a slightly larger scale in that we were using Ethereum as a mechanism of exchange between this idea of this prosumer or a, a person that have solar panels on their house 
and a local business. So then the local business could, could buy energy from those consumers directly uh, using the blockchain. And then since then, we've done a couple more projects, um, one, of one, one of which I kind of alluded to earlier, with this idea of having this, this, these smart batteries network together. And the smart batteries can essentially then buy, sell, and trade, and arbitrage energy uh, on their own using what we call an autonomous agent. So you, you program the battery, you give it access to uh, the Ethereum blockchain, and then it can essentially uh, buy and sell energy based off the, the, the prevalent clearing market price and then essentially make money. So uh, the simplest example of that is it can charge up at night when electricity is really, really cheap, and then it can dispatch that electricity during uh, peak times during the day and it can make money. Um, and then there's there's more complicated examples when you when you add solar panels and you get into self-consumption. Um, but that that was uh, another one of the projects. So uh, there, there's been quite a bit of work uh, that's that's been going on, um, mostly proof of concepts, mostly focused on this idea of peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. And what we learned from that is that although Ethereum is technically capable of creating these peer-to-peer -peer markets, Ethereum isn't sort of the limitation. The limitation is that we don't have sort of prolific penetration of both solar and batteries. So if you don't have batteries, you can't really make decisions. If you can't really make decisions on this like independent distributed basis, then why do you need sort of this distributed financial infrastructure? And so we step back and we said, okay, well, we can't do this idea of peer-to-peer -peer trading given today's infrastructure, what can we do? What efficiencies can we bring with Ethereum? And that's kind of how we arrived on this idea of, of operating as a retail electricity provider is that we can bring efficiency just on a financial basis with, without any different additional infrastructure. But then over time, by putting that infrastructure of using the blockchain in place, we can then create economic incentives and we can create this responsive financial mechanism that can, can evolve over time as uh, more and more smart you know, assets are put online and more and more uh, distributed energy resources are put online. Okay, very, very interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I knew the consensus were, was working on on energy projects. Like, I think a lot of people have heard of uh, Transactive Grid, but had no idea that there had been so many uh, proof of concepts coming from uh, from that company. Um, so let's uh, let's move on to Grid Plus then. So uh, and spend a bit of time uh, talking about uh, about that product and some of the technical aspects of uh, of Grid Plus. So um, th this is kind of unique, I guess, in the blockchain space uh, because most projects in the blockchain space, in fact, most of the projects that we interview here on the show are, are software projects, uh, and this is this is a hardware project. So so the the Grid Plus smart agent is sort of this little computer it's you know if you know people can look it up it's like this little white it kind of looks like an old um uh, it looks like the the very first uh apple wi-fi hubs like back in the you know early 2000s or whatever, whenever that was um and uh and and this this computer uh, has the capacity to you know obviously connect to the ethereum blockchain uh, I'll, I'll let you get into the details but talk you know do these computations to figure out you know what you know, what price there should be buying and selling electricity at, and then also sign transactions. Um, I presume there's a trusted execution environment in there that protects your keys and such. So, you know, tell us about the, about this product, uh, what, what it's capable of doing, and um, and um, how, how, it, how it will sort of play out in this ecosystem that you've been describing earlier. Yeah, so when we, we started looking, I mean, we've, we've done a lot of work in these proof of concepts where... Uh, we can we can interface a system with the Ethereum blockchain. You don't need sort of any specialized hardware to do it, but but that's really on a proof of concept basis. If you're looking at creating a secure topology where you have uh, this this computer that has access to private keys that can make signatures and it exists in an always online environment, it has this this sort of very high attack surface. So. The question is, how can you design a system architecture where you can deploy these things sort of into the wild without, um, you know, technically competent people essentially uh, managing them, but yet ensure that they can be used in a secure way over time? And so that kind of necessitates the idea of this dual software hardware stack. 
uh, the key piece being, as you alluded to, what we call our smart energy agent. So the smart energy agent is this general computing environment. It is where the decisions are made in terms of uh, uh, buying and selling energy. So we'll give it you know, market data. It'll use data that it collects from customers' habits, as well as, say, from their smartphone, uh, GPS location, calendar data to help predict uh, future energy use and then decide how to buy energy out of the wholesale markets. And then the other piece that we were talking about is that it needs access to these private keys. So it has, um, uh, it, it will have a secure computing environment as well as a secure signing enclave. Uh, the keys exist in the secure enclave. Essentially account permissioning and whitelisting is done by the secure computing environment and then all the sort of the, the, the macro decisions about how to buy, sell, and predict energy usage are done in this general computing environment. And, and that topology in a, uh, a multi-signature wallet setup essentially allows us to have uh, uh, a system that is secure from software attacks as well as hardware attacks as well as physical attacks uh, against essentially the private keys. Um, and so that's sort of the function, I guess, of the agent. Is this something that someone could potentially put together? Like, say, uh, is the software going to be open source? Where, like, if I've got like a Raspberry Pi and you know I want to hook up like a, a TEE on there and have my my own setup, is that is that feasible? So, at the current stage, uh, we haven't fully implemented the the secure signing enclave in the system. Uh, that's still uh, under development. So you can simulate an agent on sort of any general purpose computing device, but the management of the, the private keys and the, the whitelisting and account permissionings and withdrawal limits like that happening in a secure environment is really what you need to sort of ensure that this works securely over time. Um, so there was actually a, a student group um, that got interested and they actually kind of like made a, a variation or of a prototype that, that we put together and demonstrated at one of these uh, tech demos in Dallas last month so that you can definitely kind of like hack one of these things together. Uh, but the production one is going to have what you wouldn't be able to hack together and it's going to offer security that you wouldn't be able to get from just having say a Raspberry Pi. Okay. So in, in the white paper, they're, they're, you sort of describe um, where this device sits uh, within the broader, uh, I guess, uh, ecosystem of you know, devi other devices in your home, smart meters, and like th things like Nest thermostats, and then that device connecting to the Ethereum blockchain and to the electricity market. Um, can, can you explain sort of where this device sits in this broader ecosystem, what interactions it has with other IoT devices, uh, the blockchain, and uh, and then the electricity market. Yeah, so so if we if we think about what we're what we're creating with the agent is that you have this general computing environment um, and uh, hooked up with the secure computing environment and signing enclave, which is is one piece of the system that essentially allows this twenty four seven online environment to securely interact with the Ethereum blockchain. Now, electricity in and of itself is actually just one use case. You can really think of the smart energy gateway as a generic secure gateway for IoT to get to the Ethereum blockchain. It just happens that we're using the first application is electricity and we're purposing it for that. But over time, um, we could envision other applications taking advantage of it. So if you think about this idea of IoT devices using a blockchain to do machine-to-machine -machine transactions, um, you don't really have a good security topology if you're assuming that each one of these devices will imp implement some form of software hardware stack uh, and then having to sort of manage these accounts on all the individual devices and, and having that sort of be a reliable, secure topology. So what we envision is that as, as we move past sort of version one of this agent, we'll open up our agent to an API 
that other devices could use. So you could just have a very generic uh, trust relationship set up with another IoT device via, via simple, say, say, RSA signature. And that device could then request transactions from the agent. And as long as those transactions are within sort of the account limits and permissions that the user sets up that exist on the agent, the agent could then broadcast those transactions to the blockchain on behalf of the other IoT devices. So it's this like centralized gateway such that say in the future, your fridge, if it wanted to buy milk, instead of having to have an Ethereum wallet on your fridge, the all your Ethereum wallets and permissions would exist on this, this device, the agent device, and then your fridge would just make a nice request to the agent saying, hey, I'd like to buy some milk. And then the agent would essentially sign and broadcast that transaction. Yeah, it's, it's sort of the trusted execution environment for IoT in your home. Uh, yeah. that, that's the way I, I kind of thought of it when I when I first learned about this. And you know, like one other use case, it could be it could be the other way around too. You know, your this device could, for instance, be connected to your um, smart locks, all right, and uh, and accept payment for. Um, say like an Airbnb or something like that, and if the payment hasn't been made, the locks don't don't uh, don't let the the renters in. Um, you know, you could sort of build like a slocket type uh, model on something like this. Yeah, so I mean, in, in that example, you're kind of uh, getting to this other use case that that in some ways the agent can be thought of as like secure in home crypto banking because the the system architecture actually isn't just uh, the agent itself. It has to do with it, it, it's it's one piece in what we call two of three uh, blind key multi signature security. So there's actually only one key that's on the agent device, and it's it's what we call a blind key, which means it's unknown and it's not discoverable to even the user. And then the other two keys exist: uh, one with Grid Plus, one in a smartphone app. And um, what that basically allows is that there's no single point of software failure, but there's also no single point of hardware failure, and there's no single point of physical attack. So if somebody comes into your house and says, wants to try to steal your, your funds, they can't just steal the agent, they can't just steal the smartphone, they have to steal the agent, a smartphone, and more importantly, they have to get a PIN. So they would actually have to say coerce a PIN from you, as well as uh, stealing um, one or multiple devices and backups. So it creates a sort of a robust uh, architecture for all these things, which means that it would actually be a good way to, you know, store more money uh, in an accessible way uh, in your home, and and that's kind of where you're going with this idea of Slocket, and that I could have my generalized accounts be on that agent. It can then programmatically be responsive to say a lock, and it can sort of manage and adjudicate payments, and then control that lock in some way. So all of these things. Okay, so coming back to the energy use case. Can you talk about the the interactions? So, you know, when 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 you buy energy with this thing, where is it gathering data from? What types of devices in your home is it gathering data or, or producing? To whom is it um, sending data? Um, how does that how does that play out? So, um, in its most generic sort of implementation or the simplest implementation, all that the agent does is it reads data from your smart meter. It gets market data from us. Um, it basically looks at your consumption, looks at that market data, and then uh, creates a payment based off the amount of usage that's happened in the last 15 minutes. And then it will initiate a transaction by sending a transaction to us with its key. And then we co-sign that transaction with our key, and then we would get paid. And then we can do the reverse if, uh, say, the person's producing electricity, we get smart meter data through the ISO um, via the GSM network. So we also have smart meter data. So then we could put together a payment, sign it, and then send it to the agent. They could co-sign it and finalize it. And so there's this, uh, this two-way flow that can exist. Now, um, I do have to mention that we're going to be leveraging uh, state channels. So uh, we won't actually be broadcasting all these payments to the Ethereum chain as they're happening. Um, instead, the topology would look like the agent opens up a state channel on a periodic basis, say, you know, once every few weeks, once every month. And then it basically uh, 
instead of having to broadcast the transactions every time, we can essentially sign or sign messages and send them back and forth, uh, basically as many as we want for literally zero cost. At any point in time, either one of either us or them could decide to close the state channel, uh, and then at that point we can broadcast the the most senior transaction message to the chain and, and get our funds so we don't have this sort of like token counterparty risk because any one of us can collapse the state channel uh, at any point in time. So what that means then is from essentially like gas fees, you know, maybe 20 cents a month in, in having to actually pay uh, fees on the Ethereum network. So uh, what's the current status of this hardware device? Do you already have it made? So we have a prototype of the device, uh, and you can kind of see that in our white paper. Uh, we're in the process of uh, implementing the the secure signing environment, uh, so that's that's still ongoing. Um, but the the generic hardware uh, from um, uh, in in computing environment and the the software and the state channels. Uh, we, we actually had a demo. Uh, Alex Miller set that up to show kind of what a virtualized agent does. And, th and that can be done on the, the current hardware device. It's just the, the signing enclave isn't, isn't fully implemented. So um, it's not in a, like a secure production state of deployment at this point. But that's uh, what we're hoping to finish up in the next uh, six months or so. And like, what what does your roadmap look look like? like you have these three different eras right like uh, edison era tesla era and musk era so tell us like about how this project is going to evolve post the token sale so so the different sort of the different epochs as we call them are uh, essentially us uh putting this into you know production and kind of getting it ramped up to what you would call scale and then scaling it right so uh, the, the Edison era is basically us getting to the point of a production agent, uh, getting through the process of getting a license as a retail electricity provider, and then signing up and deploying you know, the first couple thousand of these agents with customers, and then sort of figuring out the problems that we know we're going to inevitably have uh, over time. And then as we move uh, uh, from Edison onto Tesla, that's when we start kind of scaling up um, the roadmap in terms of increasing to sort of a, a, a general just uh, customer base. When, when you say getting a license as a, as, a, as a retailer, what kind of regulatory hurdles do you think you might run into, if any? So uh, the whole system as we're designing it is meant to fit within the current sort of regulatory constructs uh, that exist. So we don't think that we need any sort of changes to the rules as they exist to uh, one, get a license and then to operate uh, as uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, the process for, for doing this uh, should take roughly uh, 90 days. And the biggest issues uh, besides uh, you know, showing the team, showing the experience is collateralization of, of assets. So there's uh, a couple million bucks that has to be put up uh, essentially to be able to interact with the wholesale markets. So uh, we, we don't anticipate issues, uh, but you know, we have been working with a number of law firms. Um, so if those do come up, we'll hope to work through them. So, I mean, so basically like once this uh, smart agent prototype is, 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 is sort of ready and you, you'll sell this, these agents in retail, right? Uh, like people, like people like me can go and buy it and presumably like I can go and buy this smart agent and like hook it up to a solar panel and is it like is that it is like is that enough is it like plug and play out of the box i have a solar panel i have this agent and i start participating in this economy or do i need to be in a specific place yeah so so there's the the, the initial functionality of um of the smart agent um uh, will be, you know, it's going to expand over time. So the initial functionality is that it will be able to buy your electricity 
on the Ethereum blockchain in real time. So from a customer standpoint, what that looks like is that when you sign up with Grid Plus, you'll get a box, you'll have the agent in it, you plug the agent in, you hook it up to your Wi-Fi, you download a smartphone app, uh, and then you just basically fund your account, and then it'll start buying and selling energy for you. Um, as you have more devices and we start supporting more devices, the ones that we're most focused on right now, just from prevalence and sort of cost of entry point are the Nest uh, and the Tesla chargers. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to, uh, we'll, we'll, want, we'll add the functionality of be able to, to interact with those devices. And then as more time goes on, then we'll look to add devices for commonly used solar inverters uh, and batteries such that you can have better uh, uh, internal control of your home as sort of this generalized uh, energy management system. Um, so it's, it's, it's an incremental roadmap. But in, in terms of region, uh, initially uh, we'll be operating in the competitive markets of Texas, which are about 85% of the households in Texas. Uh, and that's pretty much the only place we plan to operate for next year. Uh, we're just kind of focusing on that one market. Uh, there's a number of conversations we've been having with uh, some large utilities around the world. I don't know if you guys saw the Coindesk article uh, last week. Uh, we have an MOU with TEPCO, which is Japan's largest uh, electricity company. And uh, we're basically working with them uh, as we're developing this, this agent and the software stack such that hopefully once we prove it out next year in the Texas market and, and get it to that production scale that they would be interested in potentially licensing it in uh, their home markets. So um, we would be looking at expanding in other markets throughout the world, hopefully through this idea of licensing uh, and potentially addressing other competitive markets in the US either by ourselves or through licensing. So. Like, what is the first utility that I get when I, like, have this device? So if I'm in Texas, I'm a homeowner, and I have a solar panel, uh, I get this device. Um, so so what, it's, what... it's even simpler than that. You're, you're in Texas, you're a homeowner, you have no solar panel, you get this device. Your electricity bill gets cheaper. And so we think we can save 30 to 40% over a comparative uh, elect uh, retail electricity provider. So that's your first utility, is just cheaper electricity straight away. Um, and then also straight away, you also have this idea of, you also have secure crypto banking and you can pay for your electricity using Ethereum if you want to. So that's, that's pretty cool too. Um, then sort of the next sort of incremental thing, again, as, as we're focusing on, is to support the Nest and the Tesla. So if you get your Nest, now this agent is responsive to market pricing and can control your house in a smart way um, based off you know where you are, where you're going to be. It can it can predict your energy usage better, and that's part of what plays into uh, getting you cheaper electricity is that it knows more than a normal retail electricity provider because it's it's essentially predicting and buying on a bespoke individual basis, not this sort of generalized aggregate predictive basis. Um, so th that's your initial benefit, and then as we add functionality over time, and then you get into your solar panels and you get into your batteries, you you have the utility of uh, essentially getting proper uh, financial remuneration for having those assets. Cool, cool. Uh, that sound that sound interesting. So I think <clears throat> one of the final things we would like to cover is um, that you have. You have in your system multiple different tokens, right? So, like, walk us through, walk us through these: the bold token, the grid token. Yeah. So, uh, one one of the issues that we, we came up with um, when we were trying to address how do you bring efficiencies at scale, like how do you do blockchain at scale, is that you have to be able to do it with naive users, right? So, the whole idea is. Uh, most of our customers won't even know that they're using a blockchain. That's kind of why we had to design the system the way we, we designed it um, in terms of the, the, the smart energy agent, the signing enclave, the two of three uh, key multi-sig. 
and so on. Uh, but one of the issues that still exists is that you have 4x risk with Ethereum, right? So if you hold Ethereum relative to the dollars that most people think in uh, currently, you have to understand that there's there's a foreign exchange risk with that, right? The price of Ethereum goes up, the price of Ethereum goes down. So if we're going to create a system that the the average person doesn't need to know anything about cryptocurrencies, we have to have a token that doesn't have that forex risk. And so for um, customers that don't want to know anything about blockchain or use it, we have what we call the Bolt token. And essentially what that is, is a customer makes a deposit with us, uh, we create the Bolt token and then send it to them. So we're essentially uh, uh, selling them the Bolt token. And then that bull token then sits on their agent and then is spent down over time. So the bolt token is a, is a $1 USD stable token that's backed by the deposits which were used to create the bolt. And then when they send us the bolt back, we then destroy it and we move that money from the deposit account into essentially the payments account that we need to go pay off the wholesale and the distribution guys. Um, and so that's the bolt token. Uh, the other token that exists is what we call the grid token. And the grid token is uh, going to be redeemable to remove uh, markup on 500 kilowatt hours of electricity. So if you think about the, the cost to us, uh, say average wholesale cost plus distribution cost is six and a half cents. Uh, for a customer that doesn't redeem grid, we'll charge them a 30, around a 30% markup on that. So maybe they'll pay 7.8 to 8 cents or something like that. Um, and so that's kind of like our markup to, to operate as a retail electricity provider. But if you redeem a grid, instead of paying markup, you would just pay cost. So you would get your energy for 500 kilowatt hours at the wholesale plus distribution uh, cost rate. So instead of paying like the eight cents, you pay the six cents. And so that's essentially the value of the grid token. And so we're doing a, a token sale. Uh, we've done a pre-sale already um, that closed earlier this month. And we're doing a uh, public token sale on October 30th uh, for the remainder of the grid tokens. Cool. So for, for each grid token, uh... You can basically like save on the markup cost, which might be like like two cents a kilowatt hour, and you can save them on on like fifty five hundred kilowatt hours. Correct. So, so yeah, so maybe so each token can give you say ten or fifteen dollars worth of benefit once you are operating in this uh, grid plus uh, grid plus system. Yeah. So I mean the the that, that's that's roughly I would say a, a fair assessment. It depends again on the price of electricity. It depends on the regions we're operating in, uh, at least initially in Texas, using the current average price. That That's roughly a fair assessment. So when does the token sale? Uh, October 30th. Okay. And uh, how long will it run for? Uh, so hopefully two blocks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, it's time limited to two weeks. Um, but either uh, when, it, when it sells out or two weeks. All right. Well, um, good luck with the with good luck with the crowd sale, and also looking forward to uh, to the uh, the smart agent uh, being available. Do do you, do we have a price point for this device approximately? So initially, um, we're focusing on delivering it to our customers, and we're looking at doing that at cost. And in small volumes, we're targeting a fifty dollar uh, cost point. Uh, we think we can drive that down over time, but um, we haven't kind of like figured out what we would sell it to outside of uh, the customer base. Because because it, it has you the, the the agent itself has utility beyond just um, being an electricity customer. So uh, at some point, if we get ahead of the production curve, we would just sell them kind of generally as these these hardware wallet systems. Yeah, and. and and uh, so I wonder if, uh, you know, if, if this could become, you know, in, in, in this uh, age of Amazon Alexa and all these, you know, smart devices in your home, if this could become sort of the, you know, the, the, the transactional um, device that uh, sort of powers your entire um, connected yep. home. That's, that's, I guess, our, our long-term vision would, would be that, that that's what that is, yeah.
Fascinating. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. I uh, look forward to hearing more about Grid Plus and uh, look forward to, uh, um, well, hopefully a successful crowd sale in a few weeks. Well, cool. Thanks, Sebastian. Thanks, Mayor. Appreciate it. And thank you for to our listeners for once again tuning in. Epicenter is part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and lots of other great shows at letstalkbitcoin.com. If you want to support the show, there's lots of ways you can do that. Uh, you can leave us an iTunes review. It always helps when people find the show. And, and it's always great to get the feedback. And you can also leave us a tip. And the tipping address will be in the show description. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.